Good morning, everyone. Oh, wow, welcome to the Bonner Springs United Methodist Church. We're so glad to have you here. I'm Pastor Catherine. Pastor Andy is on his way from Edwardsville. Uh, and Pastor Charles is, is traveling back from Texas where he was helping out his son. Uh, he had to get wisdom um, tooth surgery. <laughs> and so they're on their way back. Uh, but it's good to be with you guys today. I'm going to start us off with our announcements. Um, today... These are our insignificant announcements. Today is National Joe Day. Are there any Joes in church today? Well, <laughs> I don't know if you're the right kind of Joe. It says, <laughs> yeah, J-O-E Day. But, I mean, you're the closest we have to celebrate. So, everyone celebrate Joe. Um, also, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and also in this, this day in... 1841, the first steam fire engine tested in New York City. Two insignificant facts for you guys this morning. Uh, now I'll move into our local church announcements. Several ladies in the church have handmade Easter bunnies as a fundraiser for UMCOR. So all the money that's raised, um, you can just give a donation on your way out. Um, we'll go to the Ukraine to support min ministry and outreach and meeting needs over there. And so you can see examples there, but they're out there in your hallway as well. Um, if you don't need a bunny for some reason, but you still want to give to UMCOR, that is allowed as well. Uh, also, the United Methodist Women's Cookie Sale is next Sunday. A wonderful week. I still hope you feel as good about it after today's sermon. Uh, we're speaking about gluttony. Uh, bring your cash, <laughs> and uh, the money that you, you'll give will uh, provide scholarship for youth attending camp. Also, you can give to that and not take cookies, but you'd just be crazy. Uh, and then Edwardsville After School Program is, is starting up. So we've had some really exciting um, ministry that's been happening in Edwardsville. And one of the first things is that many of you know we've been partnering with um, the HUD Housing at Von Dale in town and doing kind of like a, a small group breakfast church and it's been going really well and we are able to start a similar breakfast church over in the Edwardsville apartments and uh, so if that's ever something you want to do basically what we do is we ask a question of the week and then we talk about worry or forgiveness some spiritual topic and then spend time sharing and what it's been really neat is that it brings people out of their rooms in a lot of these facilities and people are coming around to share so Andy and I are looking for people who are interested in just being a listening ear and being engaged in conversation. And if you'd like to do that, uh, that's on Wednesday mornings, every other Wednesday. So you could just talk to me if that sounds like it's up your alley. And also we're, we're trying to start an after school program, uh, which would also likely be on Wednesdays over at Edwardsville um, United Methodist Church down the hill from the elementary school. So if you would like to help with that, we need you to be safe gatherings certified, which it's an online program. If you're good at the computer, it's watching video modules and then taking quizzes uh, just about safety and boundaries. If that's not your preference, this week, uh, next Sunday from 2 to 4.15, I will sit with you and help you go through the program so that you can check it off your to-do list. So for that, you would just bring your laptop or an iPad, or if you don't have one, let me know and I will bring one for you and we can get you through that certification. So it's a good way that we can have accountability across all churches. And then um, I want to let you guys know that if you want to bring candy donations for the Easter egg hunt, please do. And finally, order forms for lilies and hopefully tulips. Uh, they are out by the offering plates. And so if you'd like to uh, donate in honor of some a loved one, please do that for me as well. The most important announcement of all is Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my grandpa, uh, Donald Ebling, played basketball for KU in the 40s when everyone were, were they were KU boys, so uh, Kansas boys. So we're excited about that, and I hope you guys uh, enjoy the game as well. So now that that is all over, let us stand and sing together, Savior, Like a Shepherd, Lead Us.
you seated? At this time, I'd like to invite the children's to come forward. The children to come forward for children's time. <laughs> the children's or the children. Children's, Hi. how are you guys today? Good. Good. Okay, I have an important question today. I want to know what is your favorite food? Steak. Steak. I like steak. that. Steak. Theo says steak too. Okay, Mackie, what's your favorite food? A cheeseburger. A cheeseburger. Okay. And candy. That's also a good one. Okay. Um, Addie, Colton, Eli, anything down there you want to share? Favorite food? Um, Tell me something. 
Sausage. <laughs> you guys must have a very high meat bill in your house. What'd you say? Chicken fries. Chicken fries. It's getting exciting. <laughs> me like salmon. salmon. Sophisticated, Eli. I like salmon too. Candace, do you have a favorite food? My hamburger. A hamburger. <laughs> I'm alone up here as a vegetarian. <laughs> Theo keeps telling me every day, Mom, you should try meat. I don't think you know what you're missing. I'm like, I've had meat for many times, for many years of my life, honey. Um, well, here's a question. I want you to think of something that you really like. So candy, um, steak, some of these things we mentioned. Um, are these things that you need to live? Do you need to have steak at every meal? Yes. <laughs> I need my middle schooler here to help me out. And Theo's going, yep, you need protein to live. Every meal? Mac, do you need candy at every meal? Hey, sweetheart, Jean will come out and haunt you for the rest of your life if you get on the organ. Uh, <laughs> you, do you need candy for every meal? Oh, that is very nice. Okay. <laughs> no, right? And, and so one thing that's crazy is, do you guys ever have like a favorite restaurant you like? Yeah. And your family's like, where are we going to go? And you're like, I want that restaurant. And if they say, let's just stay home and eat supper or let's just go to this other restaurant, you're like, ugh. Does that ever happen in your family? Yeah. We have to remember that, you know what? What's important is that our bodies get full that they get full of healthy things. And it would be awesome, maybe, it kind of sounds concerning to have steak at every meal, but what's important is that we eat what our body needs and we learn to listen to what our body needs, which is all different sorts of things, not just all steak or not candy. And it seems weird that we talk about that in church, but do you know God really cares about our bodies? Yeah. That we feel healthy inside? And so this week, I want you to remember to eat all different types of things and let's all just try to be thankful for whatever we get. Sound good? All right, let's say a quick prayer. Okay. Dear God, we thank you that you love us no matter what. Help us this week um, to have thankful hearts for, for the food that we get and to think of other people that need more. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, kids. And now for our scripture reading, let's see here, it is going to be from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Let's see here. All righty. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to turn to bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, I, uh, I accidentally picked a list of topics uh, this sermon series that I happen to be an expert on. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I didn't know anything about the seven deadly sins before I started, but like gluttony we're talking about today, I know a lot. I'm good at that. I'm real. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Will you guys bow with me? Uh, God, I thank you so much for, uh, for this chance to be together. Thank you for, uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for calling us, God. We thank you for all the many ways that uh, you do. You give us big plans for our life, God, uh, and that you, you call us to something deeper, God. Help us to focus on that and go toward it without any hindrance. In your name we pray. Amen. So I love to eat. I really love to eat, and I always have. And uh, I did a fun experiment. I looked at pictures of me through the ages to see uh, uh, there is, in fact, an outward manifestation, an outward proof that I love to eat, okay? Uh, my weight has gone up and down and up 
and down and up and down more times than that, uh, even just in my adult life. Uh, in, my adult li- in my adult life, I have had an 80-pound range between my highest weight and my lowest weight, and I have been near to each of those weights more than one time each, okay? <laughs> and I wish I could tell you that right now, be- me being toward one of my lower weights was an indication that I had moved fully on to perfection and that I have finally once and for all defeated the sin of gluttony in my life Who thinks that's probably the case? No. (laughs) Okay, I don't think it's the case. And it has become very apparent to me in my reading more about the sin of gluttony that this vice is one that unfortunately can stay alive and well in so many sneaky ways in our lives. And like the other deadly sins, it can be an easy one to know a whole lot about or think we know a whole lot about without realizing that even if our bodies don't testify to it outwardly in that moment, our souls can still rely very deeply on finding comfort in food. (laughs) You cannot measure someone's gluttony simply by measuring their waistline. In some instances, there is a correlation for sure, but the two are not even remotely equivalent. Someone who is perfectly fit can still be controlled in life by their love of food and what they bring into their body. Likewise, someone who might look like from the outside they have an unhealthy relationship with food could have an entirely healthy relationship with food, and certainly one that's healthier than the perfectly fit person sitting right next to them. You just never know by looking at somebody. We can't judge someone else's gluttony, especially not simply by their BMI or some simple measure like that. So what is gluttony? Frederick Buchner says that the glutton is one who raids the icebox as a cure for spiritual malnutrition. One who raids the icebox as a cure for spiritual malnutrition. You guys think that works pretty well as a cure for spiritual malnutrition? It doesn't. Not long term. (laughs) It is a love for and craving of food, gluttony. It is focused on what we eat above the other important things in life. It is a focus on bodily pleasure and eating and one that sets us up for a lot of disappointment if we're counting on that to make us feel better. Think about it. How long does the joy of eating last? How long beyond when you take that last bite does the flavor linger with you? Anybody still taste breakfast on their tongue today? I I saw... <laughs> Proper dental hygiene. You brushed afterwards. You don't taste as much, huh, Rachel? Actually, uh, in, in the first service, I saw somebody back there when I asked that question, sort of going, to seeing if they still tasted it. <laughs> I was like, Bruce, is it, is it still there or not? He gave me a thumbs up. So uh, uh, let me give you an example from my own life. Last night, the very night before I preached this sermon, I stood in front of my fridge for a couple of actual full minutes. Catherine Catherine saw me. She can attest to this. I was standing in front of the fridge for over two minutes trying to figure out what sounded good to eat. In the long run, maybe because I was freezing on gluttony, I didn't end up eating too much. (laughs) But there was still that thought. I was really trying to think, like, what sounds good right now, right? What sounds good? I wasn't concerned with what would help my body run in that moment, but I was very concerned with what would give me a little bit of immediate pleasure and release after a stressful day. We drove home from Oklahoma City yesterday with the kids, and there was screaming involved. <laughs> oh, and the kids were upset too. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm a little hoarse today, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's a minor thing, yes, but my desire for eating just the right food last night was a reminder to me of how much I rely on food to make me feel a certain way, right? And the thing is, bodily cravings have never bodily cravings never have anything but a very temporary satisfaction. And ultimately, if we leave that hunger to its own devices, the appetite is never fully satisfied. If we try to make ourselves feel okay through our eating, if we bring uh, if we bring ourselves if we try to bring ourselves happiness and contentment through our food, Most often, we leave ourselves only with greater and greater unfulfilled desires. It's horrible, right? We're trying to make it feel better, but it just feels worse and worse, and we need more and more. We need more and better than the physical pleasure we already have in hand to to fill gluttony's insatiability. 
The growing of this insatiability is the opposite of godly contentment. But before we dive too far into the meat of this sermon, let me give you my disclaimers. I've been giving you disclaimers every single week when we talk about the seven deadly sins. This is about you and God, right? We are today talking about our relationship with food on a spiritual level. And eating does have spiritual implications. And I don't care, though, about changing your eating habits. Together, we are looking inward this series to see where God wants to call us forth to get unstuck. This is between you and God. Also, importantly, try not to feel ashamed this morning. Others can't know your whole story, your relationship with food. God loves you no matter what. Absolutely, period, stop, right? Many of us were handed bad habits around eating from our early childhood, right? <laughs> Today, Catherine <laughs> mentioned at Edwardsville that uh, in order to persuade the boys uh, to get over to the church on time, we like held a Pop-Tart in front of them <laughs> and got them to walk. And then when they were at Edwardsville, they were being kind of loud during the service. It's like, go grab a brownie, kids. <laughs> like, you see that emotional need you're feeling? Fill it with food. That's good. That's <laughs> Yeah, come, come by it honestly, right? That's, uh, g- yeah. Carrots don't work as well. Work as well. The, the carrot or stick, it's like, a, uh, uh, you might have to use a stick in that case. But a brownie or a stick, they're going to pick the brownie. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, uh, either we learn those things in our early childhood and or maybe we slipped in and out of those bad habits our whole adult lives. Habits are powerful things. They're powerful, especially the ones that we learned as kids that are just sort of the way we are. But your worth has nothing to do with your eating or your size, and anyone who conflates the two, including you, is wrong, okay? Let's also talk about how hard this is in so many ways. With some of the things that we have an unhealthy relationship with, we can just hard stop, give them up, right? Uh, drinking technically is uh, drinking too heavily is, can fit under gluttony, but if you think about that, a sin, it's anything that's like an addiction, most of those things we can just take and compartmentalize and put aside and not do those things at all. You can't do that with eating, right? You can't just say like, I'm going to choose to not eat anymore. <laughs> it's like, try it, try it, see how it goes. <laughs> Spoiler alert, if you have enough willpower, you'll die. Uh, <laughs> Don't actually try it, okay? <laughs> but mo- we can't really make ourselves not eat to that point anyway. Like, we'll go crazy and, and, and eventually give in because we, like, we need that, right? Uh, also, we have a whole huge powerful industry built around dedicating, keeping us consuming food, right? It's like there is lots of money involved. That, that, that there, there are forces, powerful forces that want to keep us fat and happy, right? <laughs> Sorry. I'm going off script a little, and Catherine is, is, is losing it over here. So, <laughs> uh, well, okay. If you think about it, though, think about the ads you see. Do, do you guys have subscriptions to things with ads? Maybe you actually have, like, a TV that you watch that have ads come up, right? Okay. So, if you think about the ads you see, there are so many ads for food and drinks and restaurants, right? So, like a large percentage of ads are for those things. And so many of these ads are either drawing you in with the promise of super delicious food and drink, right? Which is often full of high calorie and high sugary, sugary offerings designed specifically to hijack your body's cravings and supercharge your eating, right? Or if they're not that, maybe they're designed to offer you the newest and almost as delicious low calorie and low sugar food and drink to help keep those cravings alive in you, but still with, without as much guilt, but still with all of the reliance of your pleasure on food, right? It's not like it's gonna, that's not a cure for gluttony, right? It's like, that, that's something that says like, keep your gluttony alive, just use these things and maybe you won't be as fat when you do it, right? Then there's all these ads for diets and supplements and weight loss plans to help you combat those first two. <laughs> like, you see ads, and they're for this all the time. And I don't know if that's just because they start targeting ads and they, want, they, they know that I want food ads or if, if that happens to everybody, but uh, there are lots of food ads out there, right? And the thing is, in all of these things, we can find ourselves prodded into lifestyles that are run by our consumption. 
Think about the ways that we have learned to be gluttonous without as many consequences, right? Anybody in here like diet soda? I used to drink like a gallon of it a day. <laughs> I don't anymore, but it was, uh, what about, what about, oh, look at diet soda. So like, you look at the nutritional facts on it, everything's a zero, right? We don't eat that because our bodies need something in diet soda, right? <laughs> it's like, we like the taste and it's like, oh, yeah, okay. we're drawn to it because of that. Think about chewing gum. I, had, I chewed a piece of gum on the way over here. Uh, it's like, there's something about it. It gives you that sweet flavor, but think about that. It's something that's meant to chew on, but never to swallow. It's weird, isn't it? It's like, that, that is solely like a food of the glutton, and it's like, a, that's, it's a go-to for me. So, also, think about something like all these weird new, like, like fake artificial stuff, like Alestra. Have you guys heard of Alestra? It's just like, they, they used to put this in chips. It is like a fat substitute that you can eat, and your body literally cannot digest the stuff. And so if you eat too much of it, it'll have negative impacts. They put those warnings on, <laughs> they put those warnings on the chips, wow chips back in the day. There was, it was a big thing back in the early thousands or 90s. And your body just sends it straight through, right? Uh, uh, but I, the, so the, the glutton, gluttony has driven our food market uh, in a big way. And, and it uses new tricks to keep us gluttonous while at the same tr time trying to lessen the effects on our waistlines but it still fuels this spiritual malnourishment in front of us, our chronic reliance on these things. Uh, I've been reading this book to help me sort of guide along in these, uh, in, in these talks of the S Seven Deadly Sins. The, it's, the book is called Glittering Vices, and she has a quote that I, I really liked. I'm going to share two quotes from her this morning. This is the first one. She says, it sounds pretty perverse when we think about it. We're eating things without calories, Chewing things not meant to be swallowed and consuming foods that cannot be digested. So we can have the unrestricted pleasures of eating while carefully bracketing the real nature and function of food itself. We are like divorcing ourselves from the whole point of food and drink and making that sort of like an afterthought so we can just satisfy our bodily desires, right? We get so far away from our actual needs in eating and use the food to simply self-medicate so often. I do anyway. And then there's this idea, right, what a lot of us have done before, this whole like you're always on a diet or you go in between like over-consuming a lot sometimes to then crash dieting and you just boosh, up and down and up and down and up and down. I don't know if anybody else has done that. Again, look at my pictures from, from the last 20 years and you'll see, you know, 265 Andy and 190 Andy sort of like in a little dance with each other, okay? So, but, uh, but we do this and we try to trick ourselves into thinking like, oh, this is a healthy way, or this is really at this time I've conquered it. But really, we, we live in an unsustainable pattern where we're still focused on food and everything, we're defining ourselves against that food, and then we jump right back into it, and we, we do this dance with it, right? And we fall into these unhealthy rhythms that control our lives even more <laughs> than just like staying baseline kind of addicted to food. Indeed, there are plenty of ways to slide into gluttony, and the church fathers who have thought about this for the last 1,700 years have come up with different ways to categorize it. One that I really like here, uh, it puts gluttony into five different categories, okay? Uh, these words are going to be kind of weird, right? Uh, but I'm going to explain them, so just stick with it for a second, okay? The first one is eating fastidiously or daintily. <laughs> does anybody know what that means? I... If somebody does, that's good, because I didn't. It was like, when, it, when I read it the first time, it's like, I might kind of figure out, the, like, I was like, what does this mean? Okay, but this is being focused on every detail of your food. Have you guys ever, ever been to a, a restaurant with somebody that has a really, really complicated order, right? I'd like to sub out that for that other thing, and then I'd like these sauces. I don't want those, but I want this one on the side, and I want double of that. Make sure you bring this up front, and the fries are, are, are the right amount of hot, but, but <laughs> you know, you have all of these things, right, where it's like you're being so, you're trying to micromanage everything about it just so the experience is perfect for you, okay? Uh, I, I have another example that's a little less, uh, that's a little less fancy and maybe a little more relatable to me. In our first year of marriage, uh, Cal <laughs> She, she's heard the sermon already. It's sorry, Catherine. Actually, at the first service, she walked out of the room right as I said this part, and I lied and told everybody that I did this part when she walked out because she was gone. But uh, so, okay. So the first year of marriage, Catherine would be loving, right? She'd say, hey, can I heat up your leftovers for you? I'd be like, oh, that'd be awesome, right? And she would put like, you know, a piece of bread and some mashed potatoes on the plate. This is just an example. And just like put it in the microwave and press 
30 seconds ago, all right? And she'd bring it out, and the bread would be, like, hot and then really hard. <laughs> and, the ma- and the mashed potatoes would be kind of hot on the outside and then, like, icebox cold on the, in the middle. <laughs> and, uh, and for a while, I was thinking, like, oh, this might be a good example to use in the sin of sloth against Catherine. Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently this is a sin that, that, uh, that is, it has a lot more to do with my sin of gluttony. Because whenever I went to go heat up leftovers, right, I was like, the bread isn't going to go in with the mashed potatoes. Right? I'm going to put the mashed potatoes in first. I'm going to heat them up for just a little while, mix them up a little longer, mix them up. A little, I mean, I'll, it, it'll, take, <laughs> it'll take Catherine 30 seconds. It'll take me seven minutes <laughs> to heat up my leftovers. <laughs> and then after the mashed potatoes are done and mixed, I take them out, and then I put the bread in for just 10 seconds. <laughs> Ding! Okay, and, then, and so that's nice and hot at the end, and the other's hot is perfect, right? And I realize, though, it's like, this is me. This is not, this is this is leftovers, right? <laughs> this isn't even the first time I eat the food. This is just like when it's a second run stuff I care this much about. But the whole experience is catered for my maximum pleasure in eating, right? It was all about how it made me feel, right? And every single detail of it, we had to get in order, okay? Uh, this is also, you can see in people that like, you know, if their steak is done wrong, they'll, they'll send it back, right? The, if, it's, it's all about the person's pleasure, how the, the details of the food are done perfectly right. So that is eating fastidiously or daintily, okay? The second one is eating sumptuously. It's a, it's a fun one to say. And eating sumptuous food is a fun thing to do, too. Okay, good. So uh, this is eating food that is very, very rich, okay? Uh, also eating foods that help you feel filled up. Think like eating beef or like something buttery or a creamy sauce or something like that. That's eating sumptuously. And, and, and it's eating things for that feeling of like the feeling of being full. Not, not overeating, but just foods specifically designed to make you feel f- full, right? Uh, these first two are, are uh, they refer to the, like the types of foods that we eat, right? How, how, how detailed they are, how, how perfect they are, or what type of food, if it's like a rich food like this. This has more to do with the type of food we eat. The last three are going to be how we eat our food. You're going to see a difference in these. But with, on, on the sumptuous thing, I was thinking about like uh, when, okay, yeah, I had said that I've gone up and down in weight my whole adult life. Uh, well, I, I, got, I come by that honestly. My mom was always the same way, right? She would go, she would eat and get bigger, and then she'd go on a crash diet and lose like a lot of weight, and then up and down and up and down. I remember one of these times she went on the diet. You guys might remember this when it was, uh, was really popular. It was like the Atkins diet in South Beach. It's the, the, the uh, really high protein, low carb. Okay, now this diet was amazing, right? I remember, I don't know if it was that. It was one, something in that family where she would cook like maybe two pounds of beef a day, <laughs> and then like put cheese all over it, right? Cheese and beef, and she was losing weight doing it. It's like we've cracked the code as human beings to eat like <laughs> the most sumptuous food, just that, uh, and somehow lose weight doing it, right? And I was like, truly, this is the diet for gluttons, right? This is great. Uh, so uh, y- you still find ways, even when you're losing weight, even when your waistline is looking right, to still meet those deep desires in your heart, right? (laughs) You're still getting that pleasure and comfort from food, from eating this rich food and feeling full uh, and and still sort of in that neglecting the the deeper spiritual needs. Now, those are what type of food you eat. The last three are how you eat those food. And the last three in the book that I was reading, it sums it up as shoveling. (laughs) Do we have any food shovelers in here? Okay, I see like maybe two people honest enough to admit it. <laughs> One person was pointing at their partner, so that's good. <laughs> uh, it, it, this is true. At the Fraser household growing up, there was not a meal that ended outside of somebody saying, uh, I won. <laughs> like, there, it was always a competition, right, to see who could finish their food the fastest. But also, you would come in with like an excuse. It's like, yeah, you finished first, but I ate a lot more. <laughs> it's like, we were trying to like outglutton one another. <laughs> it's like, you couldn't be more like on the surface with that, right? So uh, these last three, they sort of come together in this, this like shoveling food mentality, okay? Um, 
The first one is eating too hastily. Now, this could be either eating your food too fast. Is that, I think probably that a little less, but more like not waiting to your like, appointed meal times, right? So this is the sneaky snacking in between meals. Not because your body's hungry and you need it, right? Like several small meals can be like a healthy way to eat, but this is like you've already had a meal and you're just kind of bored or sad or tired and it's like, I might eat some food. <laughs> okay, so that's eating too hastily, eating before your appointed time. These are a little more like, common, we, we understand these as gluttony. This is probably the first things that come to our mind, so they're, they're a little easier. Uh, the second one is eating too much, right? That's pretty simple, just like it sounds. You're sitting down and eat. Who, who in here loves a good buffet? Anybody? Uh, yeah, okay. More people honest on that. That's good, okay. Uh, uh, buffet, think about, uh, you know, supersize me, you know, getting the, the, the big fries and the big drink. Uh, eating, uh, eating until you're full, and then maybe eating a little more after that. And the last one is eating too greedily or eating too eagerly. Uh, I, I think that it's one that sounds strange, okay? Uh, but I think this is one that's actually, this one really kind of sums it up a little bit. And uh, it, Okay, so when I was young, we'd have a church potluck, right? Which we're going to have one in a few weeks, so uh, it'll be fun. Uh, but I used to always go, and I would only go through the church potluck line one time but I would pile my food up like this high, right? <laughs> and that's kind of a twofold thing, right? It's kind of like, oh yeah, uh, look how much, you know, like it's, it's just a sight to behold. It's a beautiful thing. But also it's like, with, especially with the church potluck, it's like there's some things at a church potluck that are better than others, right? And there's a limited quantity of that. So if, if you go up first, you get all the good stuff and make sure you get all the casserole you want. You don't have to worry about it not being there for your seconds, right? Like, well, what about the people behind you? It's like, we don't, we don't worry about that too much. Uh, so, so, so that's a part of eating too greedily or, or too eagerly. Um, but the, also, the other part of it is, like, is, is just the, the inward desire, right? Eagerly, always wanting it. Uh, and, and this is something that's considered the very most serious of all the forms of gluttony, eating too eagerly. It is a passion for a mere earthly pleasure which can make the committer eat impulsively, and reduce the goals of life to mere eating and drinking. It's interesting. So it's basically you, you live your life with the thoughts of that next meal. You get there and you're like in the zone and you just eat right. This is what life is about. It's like you are so eager for food that it sort of, it sort of like takes in the rest of your desires. And that, that's what life is about. And we can see a person in the Old Testament uh, that does this, that, that symbolizes this really well. Jacob and Esau, brothers, uh, Jacob tricks his brother into selling his birthright to him for a pot of stew, right? It's, you couldn't, it's like the, that thing blinded him so much he gave away one of the very most important things he had. So those are the five forms of gluttony. And, uh, and for me, it's like I can see myself in, in all of those at some points in my life, right? And, the, the, and that's why this, it's convicting to see like this whole thing filled out, and it's like, even when I feel like I have one of them under control pretty well, like, oh, I'm doing that, but oh, I'm still doing these other things to, to fill it in, still relying on my own senses to, to make me feel good, and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to read this. Uh, this is a quote that I did not want to say myself. I didn't want to say what she said. I wanted her to say it, first of all, because she said it well, and second of all, because it's a really hard word, and I felt that, like it was pretty convicting. She says this, there is something sad and a little pathetic about these last three forms of gluttony. It's a bit undignified to find the type of creature God created as the crown of all creation, able to perform piano concertos, invent spacecraft that take us to the moon and back, and have spiritual fellowship with God himself, sitting hunched over a plate of food, mouth overstuffed, shoveling more in as he can never get enough. But... That's the point on reflecting on what sort of creature we really are. Because we are human, the pleasure of food can never completely satisfy us. And a lot of depictions of gluttony are things that make us look more like animals, right? It's, a, it, it's trading in this amazing thing that God put in us, the image of God, meant to commune with God, these things where we can hold the universe within and, and make sense of things and and, and actually have a connection with something deeper than us. And a lot of the times, when we feel that spiritual hunger, we find ways to just say, like, I can't bear to look at that. I'm just going to meet that right now with something easy, right? 
We have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and not from us. And oftentimes, whenever we set aside our eating, we feel that deep spiritual need even more. After I uh, did a really difficult funeral recently, a couple weeks ago, that night I had the night to myself. It doesn't happen very often that I get the night to myself, but I was left to my own devices, right? I thought about going out to watch a movie or something, but I was exhausted, (laughs) physically, spiritually, emotionally, and I decided to stay in. Now, this has been a season in my life right now, the last couple of years, where I have been much more mindful about what I've been eating. But that night, I was not. (laughs) I ate. And at first, I got like a somewhat reasonable portion, but I gave myself just a little more than I had been having recently. But before I knew it, I kept popping back and forth between the kitchen, (laughs) grabbing just a couple more Girl Scout cookies here and there. I grab a few dark chocolate-covered almonds with sea salt on them. They're really, really good, okay? (laughs) Pretty hastily went down the hatch, right? I heated up a few flour tortillas with cheese melted on them. I ate those. Later on, I went back and heated up a few leftovers. In total, I had had too much, for sure. Honestly, though, probably not much more than I would have had in an uh, an average meal two years ago. But because I have been so conscious of my eating recently... I realized in that moment that I had just been shoveling a bunch of stuff down my gullet and that I wasn't enjoying a single bit of it. (laughs) I wasn't. It wasn't like I was taking time to think about what I was eating. It was an old habit, and it was something where I felt some deep sadness and longing over what I'd been through earlier that day that I didn't even want to look at it. I just wanted to fill it with something else. I was eating only to fulfill an emotional need. And yes, we're creatures, and yes, it's definitely okay to enjoy things on a creaturely level, Eating and drinking and satisfying other bodily urges can be good, good God-given things that bring richness and happiness into our lives. But so often we eat out of a place of spiritual and emotional need. We reduce ourselves down to our bodily pleasures and our very most basic creaturely instincts. And we are so much more than that. Creatures, yes, but creatures who can use food to build us up and build others up instead of enslave us. We are made for more than food. Jesus says that. Uh, after his time in the wilderness, when he's talking to the tempter in his time in the wilderness. And he did that at the very beginning of his public ministry, right? He he fasted for 40 days, and he was able to learn how to set that aside and rely fully on God. Eventually, he would institute a meal, bread, and wine. He didn't say bread and water, right? He had this rich thing that reminded you that you were alive. He wasn't against feasting. He wasn't against wine. He, his first miracle was turning water into wine. Is a symbol of like the great things that were to come, using our body to help remind us of something bigger. But first in his life and ministry, he had to go through a place where he gave that up and relied fully on God. Fasting is different than most other things we do in life, but this is something Jesus shows us as a model. In everything I read about the sin of gluttony, it says fasting is the way out. <laughs> Fasting is different than something like cheat meals on a diet, right? Did anybody have a cheat day on their diet? Yeah. <laughs> I, I did dieting like that for a while, and it was like I'd eat rice cakes for six days, and then like on the seventh day I would eat everything. <laughs> uh, and right, so that was a way of me like trying to pretend like I was working out of gluttony, but really everything that week was focused. I'm going to do this so that I can eat whatever I want and still lose weight, right? It was still around that. Fasting is different than that. Fasting is taking those things that matter to us and intentionally, as an act of giving that to God, setting that aside, being in touch with the longings that come up and offering those to God too. The goal in fasting is drawing near to God. And when we fast, when we make a habit of that, we can actually learn to fall in love with simpler foods. Now, I remember we used to go on mission trips as a family, uh, as a youth group too, uh, and uh, at home, if, uh, if I was ever complaining about food, like, oh, there's no good food around, mom and dad would say, make a PB&J. I'm like, I don't want a PB&J, that's, that's boring, right? When we were on those mission trips, we'd work and sweat and just like, just persevere in the heat and, and give up everything that normally would like make us full and happy, right? And at lunchtime every day we had the same thing. Peanut butter, jelly, smushed down, heat like all mushed together. And it's like those days that was the best it was the best tasting that I ever had in my whole childhood. It's like, you, because hunger is the best seasoning, right? You build up this sense of like longing for it and then, and then you eat it and it's like, oh, 
these things that like I took for granted all those other days, it's like I realized that they were good, right? But it took that sense of hunger to make me realize that. Uh, last year during Lent, I gave up added sugars, and I mentioned it in my Easter sermon last year. It's like I would eat a piece of fruit, and I would be like, oh man, this is good. Like I saw the good things that God gave us that just grew out of the earth. It's like that before I'd been like, oh, it's kind of bitter or whatever. Like I take it now and it's like after I stopped short circuiting my taste buds with all those other things, I took a bite and it's like, oh man, like I felt close to God and, and, and like in touch, right? So like every other week in this sermon series, uh, I'm not going to do this awesome, like, bring home the, the sermon, try to move your heart to do that. I'm putting that work squarely on you, right? I'm giving you homework. And in your bulletins, you should have a sheet of paper there that gives you this homework. And I'm going to read over it with you, okay? Uh, the first one, uh, again, this is what most of, most of all the spiritual giants say helps this more than anything, is fasting. So I'm going to invite you to consider taking a day this week or every week or every week between now and Lent, or whatever you feel called to, just take it and fast that day. T take it off of eating. Uh, obviously, I'm not your doctor. <laughs> if that's a bad idea, if you're going to pass out or something, or, or it's not going to be healthy for your body, don't do that, right? Uh, but if that's something you can handle, that, that it, spiritually, that, that can be a helpful thing. If not that, or along with that, consider spending the rest of this Lenten season, or a marked season of your life somehow, intentionally giving up something that, that matters to you food-wise, that you learn to rely on, right? Something like added sugar or meat. Alcohol, especially if you have a dependence on that, but even if not. Uh, also snacking between meals. Uh, fasting can remind us that we need God for fulfillment, and it can remind us to be thankful and appreciate food as a gift from God. The next one is another one of our sort of like journaling, taking inventory each day sorts of things. Uh, reflect each day this week on what you ate. Not counting calories, because that can get us to focus more on food and those things, but think more deeply about your food. Reflect on how much you ate and why you ate it. Uh, think about whether or not your eating was done out of just a habit, either a good or a bad one, or if you put some intention into it. Uh, ask yourself if you were thankful for your food or if you took it for granted. Ask yourself if you mindfully enjoyed your food or if you used it as a tool for an escape from stress or sadness or spiritual longing. And then ask yourself, did it properly fuel my body? for the day and set me up for long-term health and success, to do the good work that God has called you to do. The last one is to come up with an action plan on how you can shift your love from food to instead loving your neighbor. That might sound a little weird at first, but there's some examples here. Consider how your relationship with food affects those around you. Do you keep foods in your house that foster unhealthy habits or desires for yourself and others? The next one, do you overfeed those you love out of your own unhealthy relationship with food? That one hit me kind of hard, to be honest with you, because sometimes even when I'm eating a little well, I'll still like, hey, I want my boys to be happy, right? I'll drive them through and get them a happy meal or get them a breakfast baconator that I split for them. I'll take a little bite myself because I don't want those calories in me, but it's like, oh, I want to love them and, and share them, you know, like that one, that one kind of hit me. Do you spend your money on food that you could be using to help feed those who are starving or food insecure? So look at the ways that maybe you put your love for food above your love for people and make an action plan to work your way out of that. All told, we are spiritual beings as well as we are creatures. We need food to keep our bodies running, but we also can use that in ways to help us settle for less than the deep longings that God put in us. As we are able to rely on God with our desires to set those things we long for aside and let that healthy longing for God build up, we remember that we are people, yes, who fast, but also who feast in God's goodness. And we do in food sometimes too, rightly. We, we enjoy those things that God has given us, and the more that we rely on God in the everyday, the more we can enjoy and rejoice in those feasts. Amen. Now we're going to sing our hymn of response, which is, Lord, I want to be a Christian. If you'd please stand.
now comes time for our joys and concerns that Pastor Charles sent to me this week. Here is what I have. Lauren Grant is asking prayers for a nine-year-old boy, AJ, who broke his tibia and is in a lot of pain. They cannot him get him to see the orthopedic specialist until Friday, and so he is on bed rest. Please be in prayer for the tornado victims from the past week. The tornado in Round Rock, Texas, had damage within half a mile where of Charles and Judy's son, Eric, live, where he lives, excuse me. And then Ashley Eubinger continues to ask prayers for her nephew. As you'll remember, he was given fentanyl, and unfortunately they found no brain activity, and so they have to make some difficult decisions. And then I've also received a prayer request, uh, a reminder, and now we have the seat backs filled. Uh, if you guys have a prayer request that you do want to send uh, up with one of the ushers during the first or second hymns, you guys can do that. Now I think we're at a place with COVID where if you have one, feel free. Um, but also email to Charles. Um, we have prayers for, for Darla Blue's brother and sister-in-law. Um, Bob has been diagnosed with prostate can cancer, and his wife is also dealing with recurring breast, breast cancer. And, and so uh, that's a lot to be dealing with at once, so we want to be praying with, for them as well. And as always, our prayers uh, for the Ukraine and um, all the places that are war-torn in, in our world continue. Let's pray together. God, we, we thank you that you're a God who gives us so many chances. And God, so often we, we miss the mark and we find ourselves stuck. And we need your help. God, as we uh, wade through these uh, sins that pop up in our own lives, help us not to get discouraged or live in shame or guilt, but instead, may we be convicted and look to you to change us. God, give us hope that it's possible, even in areas where we've struggled, struggled our whole lives. Give us hope that we can get unstuck. God, for all of those we know in our lives who are dealing with being stuck in times of grief or anxiety, loneliness, who are dealing with being stuck in their illnesses, um, being stuck in war. God, you know um, what it's like to be in those places, God. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit and surround the people that we, we lifted up today. God, help us to be people who come alongside those that we see that are struggling and help them. Give them a hand um, to be less stuck. God, we need your love and your grace and your forgiveness each and every day. And we remember that each week as we come together. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, at this time, just a reminder uh, that if you uh, would like to give offering in person, there's a plate out by the back, and we're thankful for all of your generous offering to the church. And also on your way out, if you would like to stop and donate to UMCOR, you can do that as well. Now we're going to sing our closing hymn, which is Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me.
I invite you to receive now our benediction. God, as we go forth from this place, God, remind us that you have built within us desires to see you fully, huge desires to go out, live life fully, and to serve others. God, I pray that you give us the courage to see those things, to not fill those desires with things that are here one day and gone the next, but to seek after you. God, in doing that, let us be changed and let us go out and change the world. In your holy name we pray. Amen.